Welcome back to The Real News. We're here speaking about the deadliest wildfires in California's history, which have claimed at least 40 lives, and another 75,000 people have been displaced. More than 5,700 structures have been destroyed by more than a dozen wildfires, which ignited about a week ago, and have consumed an area larger than New York City. The city of Santa Rosa lost entire neighborhoods. What's getting far less attention in the media is the evidence linking the historically catastrophic wildfires to the effects of human-induced climate change. Again, we're joined today by two expert guests. Dr. John Abatsglu is an associate professor at the Department of Geography at the University of Idaho, and Dr. Leroy Westerling is an associate professor of management at UC Merced and co-director of the Center for Climate Communication. Thank you both so much for joining us again. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Dr. Abbasglu, let's continue. Um, forest fires, as they're commonly understood, are started by lightning. Um, but I understand that there are studies that look at data that shows that many of the wildfires we're seeing today in the U.S. don't actually start that way. Uh, they're caused by humans. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. And, and, and this is particularly the case in California. So um, if we look at much of the western United States, um, our, our forest fires in interior western United States in our mountains um, especially when we're talking about burned area and, and some of the increases we've seen, those are primarily lightning caused fires. Um, but if we think about sort of fire, fire, uh, fires that get a lot, a lot of attention that tend to be closer to people, um, especially if we go to places like California, most of the fires are caused by humans, a variety of activities um, from, you know, a, a stray cigarette butt, um, you know, vehicle fire, um, or power lines, arson, etc. And around 95% of the, of the fires that require some sort of an agency response in California are human caused. And in Napa County, it turns out that that number is closer to 99%. Um, and these fires that we're seeing here, um, you know, over this past week are, are clearly human caused fires of some origin. So humans are, are certainly adding to the fire burden across the United States. They're, they're, they're adding fires in areas that, you know, typically we wouldn't have natural fire. Um, and when they happen close to infrastructure or regions at risk, clearly uh, a lot of the disaster that we've seen this past week, we're, we're talking about those sorts of fires. Um, those are what we usually think of as being sort of bad fires. Not all fires are bad. Some of the fires that occur in our, our mountains from lightning are part of a natural process. Um, but there is something that we could potentially do about these fires through, um, you know, public awareness, um, you know, Im implementing some policies as well to try to reduce, you know, some of these less desirable fires on the landscape. What John said about lightning ignitions is really true. Uh, I just wanted to add that um, in, in my work, what we've seen is that the vast majority of the increase in area burn and in the number of large fires around the Western US has been driven almost exclusively by lightning ignited fires, larger lightning ignited fires. So when you look at California, and so many of the fires are ignited by people. That's that's also true, but but most the vast majority of fires that are ignited by people or they're ignited overall are small, mm -hmm. and contribute that much to to the total area burned, and uh, are not that responsive. Those ignitions are not as responsive to you know, climatic conditions as as the large fires are. And so in California, it's also it's that most of the area burn increase is coming from lightning ignited fires in the Sierras. Um, and, and most of the people in California don't live by those forests, right? The, those are federal forests at higher elevations. Most of the people are in the coastal area or in the Central Valley, much lower elevations. And they're not actually, most of them living next to forest areas. They're living next to chaparral and grass uh, type ecosystems. And almost all of those emissions are, are human caused. Um, and it's just a very different, very different, uh, very different system. So uh, California Governor Jerry Brown said on Wednesday that uh, the quote, warming climate, dry weather and reducing moisture, unquote, uh, contributed to these fires. Uh, Dr. Westerling, your, vo your work also focuses on seasonal forecasting for wildfire management and mitigation. Um, so could we be doing a better job at anticipating these fires and adaptation planning? Um, and then also, is the Trump administration's climate change denial going to impact our ability for wildfire disaster events? Okay, so that's a that's quite an agenda. Um, so yeah, the warmer temperatures overall, you think about it this way, we've already said in the previous... Uh, episode 
that warmer temperatures lead to more evaporation. And the thing to keep in mind is that temperatures on average have been warmer for a long time. The students in my classroom at UC Merced, every month of their lives, their entire lives, the temperatures globally have been warmer than the long-term average. They've never lived in what used to be considered a normal climate. And the, the effects of that over time are in a place like the Western US where where climate change is not increasing precipitation that much, um, you end up with drier ecosystems over time. So in the in the wet years, you're, you're evaporating more moisture, and so less of that carries over into the dry years. And in the dry years, you've got that less moisture carrying over from the previous years than you would have had, and you have the the drought of the the uh, dry years exacerbated by warmer temperatures during that year as well. And that is really driving changes in fire all around the Western US, including in these lower elevation, warmer, drier places with a lot of chaparral and things like that, like we're seeing in, uh, in the Southern California, like we're seeing in, in Napa and Sonoma. Um, but it's harder to see uh, the climate signal in the, that data um, because we just don't have enough data for something that has that many different influences affecting it. The, the timing of the, the, the Diablo winds in the fall, the, the long summer drought that you have every year, and then, and then the effects of, cumulative effects of climate change, as well as building houses out in the wild and urban interface and human landscape. Dr. Westerling, talk a little bit more about the specifics of the state of California. Yeah, so California has a very proactive approach to dealing with climate change. This is true under Governor Brown and it started under Governor Schwarzenegger. So we've had four statewide climate impact assessments so looking at vulnerability and adaptation across a broad range of sectors. So not just wildfire, but flood, coastal, sea level rise, a variety of issues around agriculture and water resources. And um, every community in California and every uh, set of you know, major statewide infrastructure, energy infrastructure, transport infrastructure has to have adaptation plans in place, how they're going to deal with climate change. And, and those govern a lot of things, including what kinds of development are allowed into the future, what kind of investments are gonna take place. I'm currently the contractor for the state of California developing all the fire simulations for the for the next century going into this is, is maybe 16 looking at um, the impacts on different types of infrastructure and insurance markets and um, California has this huge wealth of information about how climate change impacts different sectors in California because they've funded their own um, research initiatives for the last almost two and uh, it's really a, a, a tremendous resource for the state in terms of their ability to make informed decisions uh, for climate change. Uh, and John, uh, is the Trump administration's climate change denial going to impact our ability to plan for wildfire disaster events? <sighs> Well, we, you know, we have pretty good indicators that suggest that uh, the increases that we've seen in fire activity are partially attributed to a warming climate. And the longer we wait to do something to mitigate climate change, um, the bigger this burden is going to be. Um, you know, there are things that, that can be done um, to mitigate fire losses in, in, in sort of, you know, fire activity. Um, these things, though, require taking, I think, a proactive uh, view in terms of how we manage forests, how we manage fires. Um, you know, there are things that we can do, including implementing more prescribed fires, allowing fires to burn during years where we have otherwise relatively cool, um, moist conditions. We're really good at suppressing fires during those years, by the way, and that's amplifying the signal during the really warm years like we've seen more of lately. Um, so efforts that can be done on the landscape, um, I, I know there has been some thought given to um, some of the Interior Secretary's, uh, you know, plans for implementing um, practices in our forests, whether that is logging that, you know, there's some really detrimental things uh, with that. 
Um, but there also may be some things where we take a more aggressive uh, view on prescribed fire. I know that that could be a, a way that could move us forward. Um, however, it ignores the long-term view in that as we move forward, we're going to see more years like this um, where we have really, really dry, dry fuels out there. We're not going to see a decline in population, so we're going to see just as many ignitions in the landscape. And so we're just increasing the opportunity for these fires to occur and more and more people living in the wild and urban interface. That's just setting up a recipe for, you know, these sort of catastrophes and disasters. Okay, Dr. Westerling, Dr. Abatsglu, thank you so much for joining us today on The Real News Network. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News. Mm -hmm.